I hope everyone is able to see my screen. Just interrupt me if you don't. Uh, there will be time for 10 minutes question and answers at the end. So if there's anything that comes up, meanwhile, just drop it in the chat and we will look at it afterwards. Uh, as was introduced, I will talk, be talking about accessible data visualizations today and giving an intro to what's necessary uh, in order to make our data viz more accessible and what can go wrong in the process. Before I'm going to jump into data viz specifically, <laughs> I want to give a quick overview of what accessibility in itself is, because maybe some of you are new to the subject. Accessibility is generally defined as the practice of making our websites more accessible, more inclusive to as many people as possible. So that usually means making sure everyone, regardless of disability, has the same opportunities and the same equal rights on the internet as those without disabilities. Practically, that means that uh, we include uh, people with visual impairments, so for example, blind people or people who are colorblind or have vision loss, uh, people with hearing impairments like the deaf and hard of hearing, cognitive impairments like ADHD, autism, dyslexia, can also be anxiety, depression, and mobility uh, impairments, which can be neurological conditions or paralysis or loss of limbs or anything that impacts or mobility and motor function. And in order to design for that, uh, there are guidelines like the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines or WCAG in short. I'm not going to go over those in this session because we uh, want to have time for question and answers at, uh, at the end. But uh, if you're not familiar with them, I suggest you start there. And there's also the Accessibility Project or LI Project for short, uh, which summarizes the WCAG quite well and also gives a really good introduction to accessibility. And finally, I also want to share uh, these posters made by the UK Home Office. Uh, we give little pointers on how to design for people who use screen readers, how to desi design for people with low vision, physical or motor disabilities, and also uh, the cognitive impairments and hearing impairments. And the reason I want to show those before going over to the data viz is because they also point out something really important that for people with, for example, dyslexia, it's good to use diagrams and images in order to support text. So data viz in itself is already an accessibility measure in order to make data in itself or data tables more accessible for people, which is why it's extra important that we actually make our data visualizations accessible as well. And we've now uh, discussed a couple of guidelines that we can follow, but it's important to remember that just following those isn't gonna guarantee that your visualizations or your products in itself are accessible, the user experience matters too. And we're gonna dive a bit deeper into what that means, but it's very important for data visualization because it's in the name already. It's a very visual way of representing something very complex and potentially also very abstract. What I mean with that is, let's take this map as an example. This is the map of the US where uh, Walmart stores are located, uh, are, are shown uh, with hexagons. The larger the hexagon, the more Walmart stores there are in that area. And then on top of that, there's also color used there. Uh, the more blue the color is, the uh, newer the Walmart stores are, the more red the color is, the older the Walmart stores are. Uh, so at one glance at this map, we can see that on the East Coast and West Coast, the stores are newer than in Central US because the color is more blue. We also hear that there's, we also see that there's more uh, stores on the East Coast than on the West Coast. And if this was an interactive map, we would also be able to drill down in the information by hovering or by clicking or by filtering. So that's a lot of things that are already come into play there. We have location, we have shape, we have size, and we have color, and potentially also interaction. The same with this graph, which shows the amount of measles in the US per state per year, going from the 1920s to the 2000s. Uh, on the x-axis, you have um, the years, and on the y-axis, you have the states. So again, by combining the location of each square in the matrix, the x-axis and y-axis, and looking at the intensity of the color, we know how many measles cases there were approximately in each state for each year. So there we can also, on top of that, find a pattern of 
having less measles cases after the measles vaccine was introduced. So again, we're combining a lot of visual elements in order to make this really big data sets in order to get one line of summary out of it. And a lot of uh, elements come into place there. And a very obvious one is colorblindness. That's usually the first thing that comes to people's minds when we talk about data viz accessibility because we use a lot of color in our viz. And an example of that is when I first started designing data viz. Uh, one of my first graphs had a lot of green and red as the main colors. And I ran this through uh, a colorblind simulator and it turned out that green and red, big no, no, they end up looking almost the exact same for several types of colorblindness. So on this graph, for some people, the green and the red will not be able to be distinguished anymore and it just looks orange or gray. So then I changed it up and I went for yellow and purple and added patterns on top. The yellow and purple are safe colors for colorblindness. And because there's a pattern on top, I'm no longer relying on just color in order to uh, explain my information. But that graph still isn't accessible because there's also color contrast that comes into play. When we look at this one, the yellow and the purple, now it's possible to distinguish them from each other. However, the yellow against white is still too low. Uh, for texts, the color ratio has to be 4.5 to one for small text and three over one for large text. And it's similar for uh, uh, big bodies of text or big bodies of elements like uh, the bars in a bar chart. So the yellow and white is not visible enough anymore for people with vision loss. So that's also something we have to think about. On this graph, I also used patterns. And I'm sorry, I forgot to mention, we can uh, test for color blindness and for um, color contrast using plugins like X or Lighthouse in the browser or in Figma using the color blindness or color contrast plugin. And as I was about to say, we use patterns in those graphs. Patterns are really good for color blindness accessibility because you're no longer just relying on color but at the same time, it might also make the graphs less accessible for people with cognitive impairments because it adds a lot of clutter to the page. So it's also important to be careful with patterns. Something else uh, related to color is color brightness, which is something that's harder to test because there's no uh, technical requirements there other than the color contrast. But an example there is I, a couple of years ago, got a concussion. And after my concussion, uh, one lasting side effect of that has been that bright colors are very intense for me and that I easily get migraines from them. So during the US presidential elections, I was actually monitoring the results on CNN's homepage, which is a screenshot uh, visualized here from that. And they use very bright red and very bright blue, especially in combination with colors, uh, with patterns, sorry. And the combination of the very bright colors in uh, the randomized pattern really triggered a big migraine for me. And I actually was out sick from work for two days. So when it comes to bright colors, a good tip is to, if you have to use them, uh, first advice would be to not use them, but if you have to use them, uh, to just use them as accent colors and small details and go for a toned down version of them for the big bodies of color. A uh, couple of properties I'm not gonna go into detail of is uh, for example, animation. Uh, lots of graphs can use animation in order to explain the info in order to show, for example, a timeline, uh, different parts of the graph might fade in uh, by itself. But then it's important that we also in the code make it so that either the animation is disabled for people who have that flag set in their browser or that people have a toggle so they can toggle off the animation in case they don't want to see it. Similar also symbols. Symbols are really good uh, to explain data and to explain sentences and not just rely on texts, which means that it becomes more accessible for people who speak different languages. But it's also important to not just rely on symbols. And if we use symbols, we also have to explain what they mean because not everyone will have the same understanding of what a certain symbol or emoji or icon means. And language uh, can also be very interesting to use in data visualization uh, because lots of data vis is just patterns and shapes and colors. 
uh, but explaining the data and adding text and using clear language there is also important. And um, that plays into the way, for example, 538s visualize their graphs uh, during the elections or before the elections rather, when they show the report of um, how likely each candidate was to win in the election. So they had the election forecast. And they used text and icons and color in a very good combination because the titles of their graph was always a summary of what the graph was showing. So uh, this graph shows that Biden was favored to win the election. So that was also in the title. Biden is favored to win the election. Then underneath, the same data is displayed with numbers, so with statistics. Trump wins in 10 out of 100 of the simulations. Biden wins in 89 out of 100. Then the same information is again displayed with uh, dots on a graph. So we can also visually see the most dots are on Biden's side. Therefore, Biden is more likely to win the election. And that is also explained with not just highlighting the color, but also showing the faces of each candidate. So on this graph, we have text explaining what the colors means. We have uh, images explaining what the colors mean. We also have the colors that are representative, usually blue, Democrat, red, Republican. And then we also have a summary on top of it. So that's showing the data in different formats in order to improve the amount of people who can understand the, the graph. Apple also does something similar with, for example, their um, health data. The activity graph first shows a summary, which just shows visually without numbers, just with icons, how far you are to complete your standing, exercising, and moving goals for the day. Then for each goal or for each statistic, it will uh, break down the numbers with statistics. And then again, go deeper in with a graph where you can hour by hour, see how much you've exercised. Moving on to a bit more technical subjects, we have keyboard navigation and uh, assistive technology. Keyboard navigation means that everything that's on uh, our websites or everything that's on our graphs, if we can navigate it uh, with the mouse, we also have to be able to navigate it with the keyboard. This means that if you have a hover on your graph and when you hover, you get a value, you should also be able to do that by tabbing through the graph. For example, by using the arrow keys or by using the tab key, you should be able to go through your graph. If you're able to interact with your graph, for example, clicking on a bar in a bar chart in order to filter the data, you should also be able to do that same thing by just using your keyboard and pressing enter, for example. That's also something that's important when we work with assistive technology that refers to screen readers. For example, voiceover and narrator come uh, natively with iOS and or macOS and Windows. But then you also have, for example, JAWS or NVIDIA. And assistive technology that refers to uh, being able to use our sites, being able to use uh, our products, being able to understand what's visualized in a graph using just the screen reader. So whatever is visual, blind people have to be able to hear using a screen reader as well. And the example I want to show for that is another election example. This one is from Fox News. During the election, as the results came in, they had a progress bar on top where you could see how many electoral college votes Joe Biden had and how many electoral college votes Donald Trump had. And each side of the progress bar was breaking down into smaller bars or into smaller rectangles and each rectangle represented the size of the state that they won and you could see it come closer and closer to 270 throughout the nights and i recorded what that sounded like uh, with voiceover on mac and chrome uh, their developers actually i could see went out of their way to make sure all the data that was visual was somehow read out loud as well but let's take a look what that actually sounded like Joe Biden, image 306. Joe Biden, Kamala Harris, Donald Trump, image 232. Donald Trump, Mike Pence, one votes, one votes, 20 votes, four votes, two votes, 11 votes, 10 votes, 10 votes, 16 votes, six votes, 14 votes, four votes, five votes, 29 votes, four votes, seven votes, 20 votes, three votes, 13 votes, 
12 votes, 10 votes, 11 votes, 9 votes, 55 votes, 7 votes, 3 votes, 16 votes, 3 votes, 29 votes, 6 votes, 9 votes, 3 votes, 3 votes, 5 votes, 6 votes, 38 votes, 11 votes, 3 votes, 9 votes, 18 votes, 7 votes, 3 votes, 15 votes, 2 votes, 3 votes, 10 votes, 6 votes, 8 votes, 8 votes, 11 votes, 6 votes, 6 votes, 4 votes, 1 votes, 1 votes, 1 votes, 81,283,495 votes, 81,283,495 votes, 51.4% group, 270 needed to win, 74,223,755 votes, 46.9%. So as we could hear, it read the amount of votes. It read the amount of votes that each rectangle represented. One vote, two votes, five votes, 11 votes, and so on. So the developers actually made the data available. But what happened is they didn't really read who won those votes. They didn't say one vote to Joe Biden, two votes to Joe Biden. It did read the summary, so I did get the grasp of Joe Biden, 306, Donald Trump, 232. But then I had to listen to almost a minute of just votes being summed up without any contextual information. And that really proves that it's important to not just make the data available to people using a screen reader, but also to design a good screen reader experience. And uh, that's what also shows that design and UX design and user experience is very important, even when it comes to the more technical side of accessibility, such as screen reader accessibility. It wasn't enough to just make the amount of votes available. It was also important to explain what those votes meant, to say who those votes belong to. And maybe Fox News didn't even need to explain who those votes belong to because they already had the summary saying how many Joe Biden and how many Trump had. And how we design this good screen reader experience is going to be very case dependent. Let's take a look at what I mean with that. The best way of, start, of figuring out how to design a good screen reader experience or how to design a good graph in general, whether that's with regards to accessibility, usability, or just data vis in general, is to start looking at what the purpose of your graph is. Why are you making it? Who is going to use it? and in which type of circumstances is it gonna be used. For example, the graph that we discussed earlier, uh, where we looked at um, who was going to win the elections according to 538, their prediction page. We can see that um, the way they visualize the data, it very much reflects how the data is going to be used. The exact numbers, the plus 100, plus 200, plus 300, that's the electoral vote margin, which that's how many uh, electoral votes they thought the candidate was going to win with, according to their predictions. Those exact numbers are not that important. People go to that page because they want to know who is going to win. Is it going to be Trump or is it going to be Biden? And that's what this graph shows. It shows it's going to be Biden, and then it breaks down a bit more how confident they are about the fact that it's going to be Biden versus how confident they are about the fact that it's going to be Trump. So visually, they have made sure to uh, explain the data in a way that with one glance, I can see that Biden is going to win. And no matter whether I prefer reading statistics, whether I prefer reading text, or whether I prefer looking at information visualized on a map or on a graph, I understand it. It also doesn't matter whether I uh, can distinguish the blue and red, even though they're colorblind safe colors, because they're also on the left uh, side of the um, arrow of the tie, it's Trump. On the right side, it's Biden. That's also, again, indicated with color, uh, words, and images. So this is, uh, from a visual point of view, they made it accessible with that in mind. and. Also, when using a screen reader, the screen reader would not read each individual data point. The screen reader would actually just say, Biden is favored to win the election. We think he's going to win with an 89% chance. And uh, that was a summary that the screen reader read. Similarly, in the Apple example, the screen reader would do the same. Uh, it would read first in the first part where the goal mainly is 
to check whether you're on track with your goals. A full circle means you're on track. Empty circle means you haven't exercised, moved, or stood up at all today. So again, screen reader, the first thing it would do would just read me the screen, uh, read me the summary of the graph. It would say standing 50%, uh, exercising 40%, moving 50% completed all at once. Then the next thing you want to see on that page is how much did you exercise today? And how did you exercise? Did you have lots of small exercises or did you have one big uh, jogging session? Which is something that's uh, also like broken down first with statistics, then with a detailed bar graph. And again, the screen reader, uh, the first part, which was just the summary, uh, the circles, it would read in one go. Whereas underneath, uh, going through the bar chart, which shows how much calories you've burned or how much you've exercised each hour of the day. There, the screen reader would actually do it about hour by hour, and I could navigate through it. So again, they looked at uh, who is going to use this, which situations is it going to be used in, and what's the goal of it in order to decide how the screen reader would interact with it and uh, to which level of detail and how they would visualize the graph. Another example uh, could be, for example, how uh, the New York Times visualized uh, the job losses during Corona. I think this is a good example because it's, uh, it's a different type of graph. You don't go there to explore the graph and know exactly uh, how many job losses there were in February 2012. This graph, visually, it's just there to make a point. It's there to show that from the 2000s until 2020, the weekly average was 345,000 um, job losses per week. While in March uh, 2020, in that week, they had 3 million filed or over 3 million filed. So this is another example of when you make something screen reader accessible, you should think about um, what the purpose of the graph is. One way of visualizing this or one way of making the screen reader accessible could be letting the, new, the user navigate through each point. But in that case, you would have to go through uh, 52 weeks per year for over 20 years. Uh, so that would be a lot of rows the user would have to navigate through. So in this case, a good example of alt text for a graph like this could be just a description that says um, what I said earlier, the weekly average for the past 10 years has been 345,000 new unemployed people. This week, it was 3 million. And then on the opposite side, we have the graph like the measles we explored earlier, where for some people, the goal might be just to find a pattern. It could be used in a newspaper website. It could be used just in an activist campaign to show how uh, vaccines work, in which case the alt text could just also be another summary, a summary explaining um, that there were lots of measles cases until um, the mid 1960s, then a vaccine was introduced and suddenly it went down, maybe with a couple of statistics read along with it. While if you serve something like this to a group of researchers who really need to dig into the data, then they would have to find a way to navigate through those uh, 70 years of data for around 50 states, so 70 times 50 uh, cells in the data in which case the screen reader accessibility will be a bit different and people will have to be able to navigate. Uh, and you also have to think of uh, keyboard accessibility and how scientific data is displayed for different people. So again, it's very case dependent. And um, that decides how we design our, uh, our graphs uh, and it also decides how we make our graphs accessible. So um, a good, first workshop or first uh, exercise if you're about to make uh, graphs and you want to make them accessible is to just map out everyone who might use this graph uh, how will what we who are the main user groups how are they going to use it which situations are they going to use it in what's the main thing you want them to walk away from and then from there you can dig deeper and think do we need interaction for this how does this need to be visualized if we visualize it one way, how will this affect uh, people with different types of disabilities? How will this affect our different types of user groups? And then keep designing more and more and go deeper as you go. And again, 
just following uh, those guidelines isn't going to guarantee accessibility, the user experience matters too. So again, as I said, it's important to uh, test frequently and to iterate on the process and look at it as just yet another design challenge. Look at it as another development challenge. It is accessibility, is, it is intimidating, but we can start by breaking it down per user group and start breaking down what the user needs. And that's why accessibility should be part of the entire process because it's really gonna make that much easier. For example, um, usually we think of accessibility as something where a visual designer might come in and think about the colors we use or a UX person might come in and think of how the information should be structured. And then we hand it over to a developer and that developer will implement it and will think of uh, how to add alt text, how to do this, the um, keyboard navigation and so on. While in reality, everyone involved in the process of product development or involved in the process of design or data visualization should be involved in the process of accessibility as well. People working with copywriting uh, can make sure that there's clear language for everything, can make sure the data is summarized in an understandable way. People working with internationalization have to make sure that uh, the copywriting from the previous person is also understandable in different languages and that uh, uh, when we translate uh, some kind of contexts or symbols or uh, figures of speech, that those are also understandable in different languages. People working with data science can give us insights in how the data works uh, and which consequences it has on both usability and accessibility. And then, of course, the branding, visual design and UX design can take care of the visual aspect. UX should also take care of um, the screen reader accessibility and can together with the developers find a way of making good um, keyboard navigation and then QA project management are in charge of making sure everything is implemented properly and um, leadership and investors can make sure everyone is held accountable. And in all of this it's okay to know that you can start small. You don't need to make the most complex biggest, most accessible graph ever from the starts. It's okay to start with a little piece and scale it up and make it better as you go. But the most important part is that you have a plan. What I mean with that is it's not okay to release a product with inaccessible graphs where the information is not available to disabled people. But it's okay to start with making the information available, for example, with just a data table then people can use that table to get the information initially. And you can use that to go out to blind people, for example, and test it with a screen reader. Find out what their needs are. How do, we, do they want to explore that data? How have they used data visualizations in the past? What's something that works for them? What's something that doesn't work for them? Then you can improve it and make a first improved version, for example, uh, where the data just reads a summary. And then as you go, you can figure out how do they react to the summary. Then you can add simple interaction. Then you can take that information back, test it again, add more complex interaction. Uh, and in all of that, it's important to include disabled people in the process. It's important to actually test with disabled people. We can test ourselves using a screen reader like I demoed earlier. And we can figure out what works and doesn't work. We can use uh, the WUKAG in order to make sure we meet the guidelines. We can use tools like X or Lighthouse or Colorblind or Stark in order to make sure our products are meeting a certain bar of accessibility to make sure our colors are accessible, to make sure there's alt text to our pictures, but to know if it's actually useful, if it's actually usable, whether people have a good experience, for that we need to include disabled people and test with them and include them in our teams and center the work also around them. And for that, I also have one tip, if you're gonna test with disabled people, if you're gonna test with blind people, make sure that your graphs or your products in general have a certain level of technical accessibility already. Take a graph that's somewhat accessible to them because otherwise you're gonna give them a graph where they can't interact with, they can't hear anything with or the information isn't clear and the only inputs you're going to get is that you 
have to take it back and that you have to make it a first level of technically accessible. So make something small that's somewhat accessible, take it to people, start testing it, improve it. And in the end, accessible products are better products, which is why it's so important to focus on it as well. And that was the end of my talk. I rushed a bit through the slides because I tried to make sure I could include everything and still have time for 10 minutes Q&A. Uh, but if you have more questions afterwards or there's anything that's unclear that we can't cover in the Q&A, uh, you're welcome to reach out to me on Twitter. I'm at Leah Trisbian uh, or on my personal website, fosheim.io. And we have also put together uh, a GitHub repo with resources, which you can find on github.com slash DataVis Accessibility or DataVis Ally. Thank you for the talk and let's see if there's any questions. Wonderful, thank you so much, Sarah. Um, I'm looking at the chat and Q&A. I don't see any questions yet. Um, if anyone does have any questions, please type them in now. Um, okay, I do have one here. Holly asks, What's the best way to get started with accessible code for um, data visualization? Um, there's a lot when it comes to code that's um, that's still a bit up in the air because uh, as right now, uh, when it comes to code, the main way of making visualizations is with SVG or Canvas. Uh, so my go-to place would be learn about SVG accessibility, learn about um, keyboard navigation, how you can work with tab index, for example, uh, but also just start testing uh, data vis with a screen reader, start testing it with keyboard navigation. If you see a nice data vis somewhere, inspect the code, look how they solved it, and um, try to listen to it with a screen reader. VoiceOver comes for free with every Mac, Narrator comes for free with every Windows machine. So that's kind of how I got into it. I just started experimenting. Uh, something else as well, if you're working with code, uh, it's important to look at the libraries you're using. For example, um, what's their name? The name slips my mind for a second. I will write it in the chat or come back to it as soon as I can think of them. High charts, there they are, sorry. High charts are one uh, where accessibility is quite well implemented in the sense that they give you lots of options to make your charts accessible. Uh, also, if you build them yourself using D3.js, you can build it in yourself. For example, you can use ARIA labels or ARIA descriptions or alt texts to make them screen reader accessible. Uh, but there's also plenty of libraries out there with pre-made graphs and those usually are not very accessible. So I would really investigate it before you use a coding library. Okay, there's a, another question. Do you have any insights on maps? Uh, maps specifically, I don't have too many insights on it, but it's again, my advice would be uh, treat it like any other graph and think again of um, what the, um, what the purpose of it is, what are you visualizing? Um, for example, again, the map of the US that I showed earlier with the, um, with the hexagons visualizing the Walmart stores, that's a good, something you can start with there is thinking, is the map showing one story? Can I summarize it in one sentence? Is it something where I have to explore data per state? Because then maybe you need to think of how to make it keyboards how to make the keyboard navigation work uh, when tabbing through states. How do people navigate through states? Do they want to move up and down or left and right? Do they want to tab? Um, so like starting with where, which areas of the map is something gonna be displayed? Why is it gonna be displayed? Is there gonna be interaction? Maybe you want to explain, uh, you could summarize the data per state or per country or you could summarize the data in general or let people navigate through it. Could be a table, like maps are also something very broad. So again, my first thing would be narrow it down, try to understand what you're gonna do with your map and then look for answers specifically on that issue. Uh, we have another question. What's the best way to create alt text for data visualization images? Uh, it depends on what type of data visualization. If it's something with static data that's not going to change, uh, 
uh, you could even hard code it and write it yourself. Uh, in which case, I'm going to refer to you, uh, you to an article written on Nightingale. I will. The link is listed on the github.com slash dataviz ally. Uh, but I can also, after this talk, paste it in the chats. Someone wrote a really good guide on how to write alt text there. Uh, but it's also finding a, a good balance between um, giving a good summary describing the data, but also not giving too much text. Because alt text, you also have to think of it as uh, it's something you can't really skip through. Once it starts explaining it, you probably don't want to sit there and listen to five hours of data being read to you. So finding a good balance of how much you write. And then also, if your data vis is updating live, if it's not pre-created data, it's a bit hard to write your own alt text in advance. So then something I've done in the past is actually starting with extracting some statistics. What's the minimum and maximum? In my case, in the graph, it was useful to show that. Maybe in your graph, it will be something else, a high-level statistic or a high-level uh, Apple says, for example, uh, for some of their graphs, they say the minimum value is X, the uh, maximum value is Y, and then they read the median. So you can start with some statistics, and then there's probably also libraries out there that you can use to generate alt text. However, if you have very dynamic data and very complex data, just alt text might not be enough, and then you maybe want to navigate or want to have some alternative ways of exploring the data. Wonderful, thank you. Um, another question here, how does Microsoft do with its chart and graph tools in Office? And then someone else added, um, and Google too. <laughs> uh, I actually haven't tested the ones from Microsoft and Google inside of like Office and, um, and Google Docs. So I'm not 100% sure to be honest. Uh, but what I do know is that it's quite hard to make um, or can be a pain uh, to make PDFs accessible. So my guess would be it's going to be the same with their charts. Are there any other questions? It looks like that's it right now that I see in the chat. Can folks reach out to you, uh, you said via email or Twitter, or are you on Slack as well? Uh, I'm not on Slack, but I will write my email address in the chats in case people have questions. And also at Leah Frisbean on Twitter. Okay, we do have another um, question that came in the Q&A. At what point do you start usability testing with users with disabilities? Yeah, so as I started saying earlier, uh, I think it's best to wait until you have some level of accessibility uh, in order to just not go to someone and give them something that's not even usable for them to start with. Uh, so what I usually do before I test anything with even people who aren't disabled is uh, to run a little audit, like a very high level one, using uh, the checklist that the LI project or accessibility project has provided, and also looking at uh, the Lighthouse scores. Because when those two are more or less okay, then I know that there's at least some basic level of accessibility and that there is something that will be testable. And also, if you're going to test before you have something that's accessible, uh, my advice would be try to find some graphs online that are accessible, that are more or less a similar functionality or similar type of graph that when you're what you're gonna use and just check how people use it, have a conversation about it and don't, in that case, don't test your own product that's not testable yet. Uh, for the reason that there is not that much information about data with accessibility out there yet. So any information you can gather in your process is good information. Okay, we just had one more come in. What has been the biggest surprise you found during this journey into data visualization? Yeah, that's a good one. Uh, the biggest surprise has been that the best data visualization is often no data visualization. Um, every time I tested my graphs with users, 
no matter how simple I made them, often people's reply was, but I can make charts myself. I have Excel. Why would I want to have a chart? I just want you to tell me what to do. Just let the data tell me, do something with it and tell me what it does. And I've noticed the same, both from an accessibility and usability point of view, which heavily overlap. Um, people really, we tend to think of DataViz as this really cool thing where we can make really complex charts and make the wildest things out there. But the wildest things out there and the most pretty graphs out there are usually not the ones people find useful. People like simplicity. Okay, I'm not seeing any more questions coming in. Oh, <laughs> just as I say that, one pops up. <laughs> Any info on GIS data? Actually, not sure what you mean with GIS data. Catherine, can you share more insight on, on what GIS data is or what you're referring to? Geographical oh. info systems. Uh, not much more. It sounds like uh, when it comes to geography, it's probably a similar answer than what I gave to the question about the maps earlier. Uh, but other than that, not too familiar with the subject, unfortunately. <laughs> Any more questions? I'm hesitant to say no because one might <laughs> pop up. <laughs> but right now I'm not seeing any more at this time. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. That was a yeah, wonderful thank presentation. You thank you. I think I rushed through, through it a bit. I'm sorry for that. I talk very fast. But thank you for having me. It was really nice uh, having the first talk of the day today. Yeah, hey, Sarah, it's, it's Rob. You're very welcome. Another question did come in, and since we do have uh, about five minutes left, I'll relay it over to you. Uh, should we be including a link to a CSV or JSON file for our data? Uh, yeah. my It's not necessarily going to make the accessibility better because a table... Uh, or a JSON file or a CSV file isn't necessarily more accessible or more user-friendly than a graph. Uh, but if you're at a point where your graph is not accessible enough yet, I would definitely include it because even though in itself it's not more accessible or not very good for accessibility, it's still more accessible than having nothing. <laughs> and also if you're at a place where the you haven't really built a full graph system yet or you're not sure yet how people are going to use your data including it can also be useful because it can give you extra information of how many people actually downloaded it which is a good indicator that something is wrong with the ux or the accessibility of your graph awesome well we will i will keep an eye on uh we'll keep an eye on all of the channels to see if there are any last minute questions uh sarah really thank you so much um you. great uh, great to, to have you um, from Europe. Uh, don't know if it would have been possible had we not been entirely virtual since the, the world broke. Um, so really glad that it worked out um, and, and really interesting um, content. That, that's why we, we reached out because uh, we see a lot of challenges with data visualizations when it comes to the content that that we um, encounter. Uh, there is a question, this is a good one as well. Have you used sonification for uh, data visualization at all? I myself haven't, but I think it really works for some types of graphs. If you need to have very detailed numbers, it doesn't work very well, but when you want to have the general gist of how patterns are formed in a graph, it's quite nice. Uh, you should look up what I think it was Harvard or Stanford, one of the big universities made a study and visualized space data uh, or visualized images from space using sonification. And you could hear where the stars were and how many stars there were in each location. 
And if you have an iPhone, Apple does the same with their uh, stock app, I think it is. Uh, so it definitely can be used for making it accessible for very specific use cases. I remember seeing a talk at the um, CSUN conference uh, a few years ago now when sonification was just becoming more widely available. And I want to say that somebody was using something from Google uh, to apply it. Um, so yeah, that was a good question because I haven't really kept up with where that's gone um, and how, how helpful it can be. And, and again, on the authoring side, Right, that's always the challenge. You mentioned high charts, and, and that's one of the things that we try to keep an eye on. Uh, the different authoring tools themselves uh, can make it either difficult or easy to, to build in accessibility. So and I do think they've all, not all, but I think a lot of them have begun to focus more on accessibility, um, certainly for the screen reading experience, but I also think for the visual experience, they're, they're all, or many of them are taking strides. So. Um, it's it's good that it's becoming easier on authors and designers to actually make this stuff work. So I don't see uh, y'all monitoring Slack. Do we have any other questions? We're bumping up against the, the end of our time here for this session. Yeah, I don't see any other questions at this time. Okay. Well, Sarah, really, thank you so much. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um,